We know that for some, this will be the first time that they will hear a message that questions the validity of one of our fundamental beliefs. But to you we say, please do not be put off until you see the evidence clearly presented to you in this following presentation. The greatest deception ever to hit our beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church has sadly been the acceptance of the Trinity. Other Seventh-day Adventists have been sounding the warning regarding this unbiblical doctrine for years. We are just adding our small voice to this loud cry. This is a Bible study style presentation. It contains an urgent message for us all. Please pray for the Holy Spirit to guide you and have your Bible with you to see the truth for yourself. May the Father and Son continue to guide you from the Pioneering Again team. If the Bible does not use the phrases God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, why do we use those terms? Because we do. When we say in extreme three, we believe that three divine persons equal yeah, one that's divine right. being. That's right. Scripture teaches that God is one, and yet that one God is composed of three persons. So the Bible's really clear that there is a trinity. There is a Father, Son, and Holy Matthew Spirit. Matthew 28. Are we with here, my friends? What do we find in verse 19? How many persons are listed, listed in verse 19? There are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have been together from eternity and will be together through eternity. Every Sabbath, Millions of Sabbath keepers from around the world attend church, but who are they worshipping? Many will tell you that they are worshipping God, who they declare to be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, a triune God who are one. Is this concept about God correct, or have they been victims to one of the greatest deceptions to ever hit the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In this Bible study presentation, we shall examine if the doctrine of the Trinity is indeed biblically correct. We understand that this can be a sensitive issue. However, from the outset, this presentation has not been designed to condemn anyone, but to expose how Satan has potentially deceived millions of Seventh-day Adventists from around the world into worshipping the Trinity. This presentation hopes to help Seventh-day Adventists return back to the worship of the one true God that was once delivered to the saints. So please have your Bible in your hands and be prepared to see this truth for yourself. Many Seventh-day Adventists will tell you that they are worshipping God, who they declare to be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, a triune God who are one. How many gods are there really, according to the Scriptures? Let's begin by asking the question, how was God introduced to the ancient believers in Bible times? Let's begin our quest by seeing how the ancient believers in the Old Testament era 
introduce God. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 to 4 and verse 6, listen to how God is introduced by the ancient believers. In verse 3, it starts, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Verse 6, Do ye thus recruit the Lord, O foolish people and unwise, is not he thy father that have brought thee? Have he not made thee and established thee? So we see from this verse that God is introduced as the father. Let's read through some more examples. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10, we read how King David introduces God. And it reads, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. In Psalms 89 verse 26, it reads, He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Let's now see how the prophet Isaiah introduces God. In Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 16, it has this to say, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. Then in Isaiah chapter 64 verse 8, it reads, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. And finally, let's see how God introduces himself to Malachi the prophet. In Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 it reads, A son honoureth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honour? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priests that despise my name, and ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? So we see that in the Old Testament times, the ancient believers introduced God as the Father to all the believers. So now, let's take a look and see how the believers in the New Testament times introduced God. Let's see how Christ introduced God to the believers in the New Testament times. In Mark chapter 11 verse 22 and verses 25 to 26, Christ had this to say, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. And verse 25, and when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if we do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So we see that Christ introduces God as a Father to his believers. Let's take a look at more examples of where Christ addresses God as the Father. In John chapter 4, verse 21 to 24, it reads, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain 
nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In John 6 verse 27 it reads, Labour not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him have God the Father sealed. Let's now see how the Pharisees address God in John chapter 8 verse 41 and it reads, Ye do the deeds of your Father. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Then they said this to him. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one Father, even God. Again, let's see how Christ introduces God to his believers. In John 16 verse 27 it reads, For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. And finally in John 20 verse 17, Christ had this to say, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. So, we just seen how Christ introduced God as the Father to his believers. Let's now see how the Apostle Paul introduced God to the believers in his times. In Romans chapter 1 verse 7 it reads, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 20, Paul has this to say to the believers. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 11, Paul had this to say. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And finally, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13, it reads, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness, before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. So, in the New Testament times, God was introduced as the Father. We have just seen God being introduced as the Father in both the Old and New Testament times. Is the Father then the one true God? Let's take a look and see. Let's begin in the Old Testament to see if the believers in God the Father also recognized him as the one or only true God. Let's begin by looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10 to 11. And it reads, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, 
And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father for ever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And in Malachi chapter 2 verse 10, it has this to say, Have we not all one Father? Have not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? So clearly then, the Old Testament believers understood that the Father was the one true God. Let's take a look now at the New Testament believers to see if they too acknowledge the Father who is God as the one true God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6, it reads, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Then, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6, it says this, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Let's take a look now at an another example of the believers in the New Testament times recognizing that God the Father was the one or only true God. God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3 and verse 9 it reads, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Let's now take a look to see if Christ taught his disciples that God the Father is the one or only true God. Let's take a look in John chapter 17 and verse 1 to 3. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So, on the authority of Christ, all the believers in the New Testament era saw that God the Father was indeed the one true God. Interesting, I was in Lebanon recently and I met a Muslim man. He said, you're a Christian? I said, yes, I'm a Christian. And he said, there is only one God. Because a big challenge that Muslims have with Christians is this idea of three. And they would say, well, you Christians have three gods, but there's only one God. I understand where he's coming from, but we Christians don't have three gods. We have one God, but that God is comprised of three 
co-eternal persons. The Father is God. The Son, Jesus, is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And together they comprise God. Or let me say, all three are divine. Now again, you know, if we, if we talk about this for too long, our minds will bend. It's, it's a difficult concept. How are three one? We have just learnt from the scriptures on who God is, which is of course the Father, the one true God. But who is Jesus? A popular error that is being taught in the churches today is that Christ is called God the Son. Nowhere in the scriptures is this title ever given to Jesus. He is of course called the Son of God, and we shall touch more on this in another up and coming video. Another error that has come into the Adventist Church is a belief that Jesus is not the literal Son of God, and that the term Son is used metaphorically. In the Adventist World magazine, one of our top scholars stated the following, The Father-Son image cannot be literally applied to the Divine Father-Son relationship within the Godhead. The Son is not the natural, literal Son of the Father. The term Son is used metaphorically when applied to the Godhead. Another error about Jesus that has crept into the Adventist church is that Christ was not called the Son of God until his incarnation. This belief really does destroy the gospel as it teaches us that God the Father did not actually send his only begotten Son to die for us. Anyone teaching any of those three false belief systems concerning the Son of God is in real danger of being destroyed in the lake of fire. It is that serious. You may ask the question, why? It is because those three false belief systems makes God the Father a liar, which of course he isn't. Most Seventh-day Adventists define the Holy Spirit as an entirely independent divine being having all the attributes of God and is considered a God himself like the Father and the Son. They also state that this independent divine being called God the Eternal Spirit occupies the position as one of the three persons of the Godhead. Is this position about the Holy Spirit correct according to the scriptures? Who is this third divine being? Let's take a look and see. To the believers in the Old Testament times, who was the Holy Spirit? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it reads, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 10, it says this about the Holy Spirit. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Then, in Psalms 51 verse 11, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. In Joel chapter 2 verse 28, it says this concerning the Holy Spirit. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1, it says this concerning the Holy Spirit. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So, according to the Old Testament believers, the Holy Spirit is the presence of the Father, and not a separate and distinct third being. To the believers in the New Testament times, who was the Holy Spirit? In Romans chapter 8 verse 9, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 8, it says this about the Holy Spirit. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 9 to 11, Peter, talking about the effects of the Holy Spirit on the prophets who wrote the Holy Scriptures, had this to say, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Then, in Galatians chapter 4 verse 6, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 6, the believers had this to say about the Holy Spirit. But after that the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Did you notice that the New Testament believers use the terms Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ interchangeably? Why, you may ask? The reason why the New Testament believers used the expressions Spirit of God 
and the Spirit of Christ is because they well understood that the Son of God was begotten from the Father and therefore would have had the same divine attributes as his Father, which included the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 3, verses 34 to 35, it tells us, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. So therefore we see that all power was given to Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit, which comes from the Father and his Son. And it says, For through him, Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. So according to the Scriptures, the New Testament believers clearly understood that the Holy Spirit is connected to the presence of the Father and his Son and is not a distinct and separate third being that many believe. We shall touch more on the nature of Christ later on in this video. In Psalms 139.7, it gives us a Bible definition of what the Holy Spirit is, and it says this, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? So who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the presence of the Father or His Son. For those who do not think that the info about the Holy Spirit was not clear enough in the scriptures, then let's take a look at some Spirit of Prophecy quotes. What does the Spirit of Prophecy say on who the Holy Spirit is? In the Bible Echo, dated January 15th, Ellen G. White makes this statement about the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit, the Father and the Son will come and make their abode with you. In the book Education, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. The Lord's throne is in heaven, yet by His Spirit He is everywhere present. He has an intimate knowledge of and a personal interest in all the works of His hand. In that classic book called The Ministry of Healing, Ellen G. White has this to say about the Holy Spirit. The Bible shows us God in his high and holy place, not in a state of inactivity, not in silence and solitude, but surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of holy beings, all waiting to do his will. Through these messengers, he is in active communication with every part of his dominion. By his Spirit, he is everywhere present. Through the agency of his Spirit and his angels, he ministers to the children of men. In the Bible Echo, dated August the 5th, the Spirit of Prophecy has this to say about the Holy Spirit. Yes, in giving the Holy Spirit, it was impossible for God to give more. To this gift, nothing could be added. By it, all needs are supplied. The Holy Spirit is the vital presence of God, and if appreciated, will call forth praise and thanksgiving and will ever be springing up into everlasting life. In Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. Christ tells us 
that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, which the Father shall send in my name. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. This refers to the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ, called the Comforter. In the Signs of the Times, dated April 7th, it says this about the Holy Spirit. Christ is withdrawn only from the eye of sense, but he is truly present by his Spirit, as when he was visibly present on earth. The time that has elapsed since his ascension has brought no interruption in the fulfilment of his parting promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In letter 124, dated 1897, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. When trials overshadow the soul, remember the words of Christ. Remember that he is an unseen presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. In Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, it has this to say about the Holy Spirit. But it is the leaven of the Spirit of Jesus Christ which is sent down from heaven called the Holy Ghost and that Spirit affects the heart and the character. And finally, in a review and herald dated November the 5th, 1908, Ellen G. White had this to say about the Spirit. The Father gave his spirit without measure to his son. So through the spirit of prophecy, we see that the Holy Spirit is connected to the presence of the Father and the Son. Now there are many perspectives to address the third person of the Godhead from. But as I always say, as a book has two, four, six sides, you never see all six sides at the same time. Right or wrong? Correct. And I'm going to share with you my perspective why I believe from Scripture that the third person of the Godhead is not co-substantial with Jesus or the Father. It's a separate individual person. Matthew 28. Are we there, my friends? What do we find in verse 19? How many persons are listed, listed in verse 19? There are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, watch carefully. How many persons are in the Trinity based on Catholics? How many? There are three persons in that Trinity. So my question is, if we believe that based on Scripture, there are three persons in the Godhead, and the Catholics say there are three persons in their trinity. Does that mean a person who believes in the Godhead is a Trinitarian? When Christ sent the Holy Spirit to reveal God's glory, it does not negate the first. There are still three separate beings. Is a third person separate from Father and Son? So why have you allowed people to deceive you. Let's go again. They say if you believe the third person is separate from the Father and the Son, you are all Trinitarians, Catholics, Babylonians. Question, based on the Catholics, is the third person of the, God, of the Trinity separate from Father and Son? They say it's the same being. So they have anti-Trinitarians, so-called. They have built up a straw man. Because the Catholics don't teach that. All three are one being. 
Christ. One person, being, body being, whatever being is, being. Because we can never fully understand the nature of God. So don't let people deceive you, friends, if you believe in a third person being separate from father and son, that you are all of a sudden a Babylonian. No. We are now going to take a look at some of the Bible verses that claim to support this mainstream Trinity doctrine that there are three persons of the Godhead, including the Holy Spirit being a separate divine being. So please stay focused as we take a walk through the scriptures. Let's take a look at the first misunderstood Bible text. In Matthew 28, 19, a very well-known and familiar text used by Trinitarians to try and defend the Trinity doctrine, it reads, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The key to understanding this misunderstood verse is to look at the previous verse in this chapter and go to Matthew 28 verse 18 where it reads, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Keep your eyes on the word power. We are now going to use the scriptures to interpret this particular text. Let's turn to Luke 24 verse 49 and it reads, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So what was the power that Jesus was going to send from on high? Well, we don't need to guess. This very same verse explains, and it is simply this, the promise of my Father. Let's now take a look and see what exactly was the promise of my Father. In Acts chapter 1 verse 4 to 5, it states this, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So, let's have a recap. In Matthew 28, 18, we are told that all power was given to Christ. Then, in Luke 24, verse 49, we see that this power is linked to the promise of the Father. And now, in Acts chapter 1, verse 45, we see that the promise of the Father is linked to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So now, let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 33. This Jesus have God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So now, let's take a recap 
at all the verses that help to explain Matthew 28 verse 19. In Matthew 28 18, Christ was given all power. Then in Luke 24 verse 49, we see that the power was connected to the promise of the Father. Then in Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, the promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then in Acts chapter 2 verses 32 to 33, we see that the Holy Ghost was finally given to the disciples. So careful examination of the scriptures explains convincingly Matthew 28 verse 19 and also proves that the Holy Spirit is not a separate and distinct third being that many believe because the Holy Ghost is the presence and power of the Father and Son. So this verse that Trinitarians use to substantiate the doctrine of the Trinity has well and truly been shattered. Let's take a look at another misunderstood Bible text. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, this verse is used extensively to substantiate the Trinity doctrine. However, is the use of this verse valid? Let's take a look and see. This verse says the following. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In this verse, Trinitarians state that the word us implies the three co-eternal persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Is this assumption true? Let's take a look at the scriptures to get the correct interpretation of the word us in this particular verse. In John chapter 17 verse 21, it reads, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. As we have just read, the only us in this particular verse is the Father and the Son. Why did Jesus not mention that other third divine being for that oneness he was praying for concerning his disciples that existed between him and his Father? In Proverbs 30 verse 4, this verse is in reference to the creation. Let's take a look on who is the us that partook in the creation of the earth and all its elements. It reads, Who have ascended up into heaven or descended? Who have gathered the wind in his fists? Who have bound the waters in a garment? Who have established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So clearly then, we see that this verse is talking about the Father and the Son. Let's take a look at a final Bible verse that convincingly explains to us how many divine beings created the heavens and the earth. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So again, we see that the scriptures only mentions two divine beings who created our universe, the Father 
and his son. In the spirit of prophecy, it has this to say about Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and it reads, After the earth was created, and the beasts upon it, the father and son carried out their purpose, which was designed before the fall of Satan, to make man in their own image. They had wrought together in the creation of the earth, and every living thing upon it. And now God said to his son, let us make man in our image. So, allowing the scriptures to interpret itself explains convincingly Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and also proves that the Holy Spirit is not a separate and distinct third being. This text, which Trinitarians use to try and prove the erroneous doctrine of the Trinity, has just been shattered. Let's now take a look at another Bible verse that claims to support this mainstream Trinity doctrine. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 5 verse 3 to 4 and it reads, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Many Trinitarians will tell you that Ananias was lying to God, the Holy Spirit. Is this assumption correct? What many people fail to do is to go to verse 9 in this very same chapter to get the true answer. So let's take a look at chapter 5, but this time verse 9. Then Peter said unto her, Sapphira, who was Ananias' wife, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. So we see that the previous verse in Acts chapter 5 verse 3 to 4 was not Ananias lying to a separate God, called God the Holy Spirit, as many affirm, but was lying to the only true God, who was present by his Spirit. So this text, which Trinitarians use to try and prove the erroneous views of the Trinity, has just been well and truly shattered. Let's now take a look at another misunderstood Bible verse that claims to support this mainstream Trinity doctrine. Let's take a look at John chapter 14 and verse 16. And it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Many people assume that when Jesus used the words another comforter, that he was referring to another divine being called God the Holy Spirit. Is this correct? Let's now see how the scriptures interpret itself concerning this. In this very same 14th chapter, Christ elaborates on who this another comforter is. Let's read verses 17 to 18. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. In the clearest possible language, Christ says that he will come to you. 
Therefore, the words another comforter was referring to himself. The disciples clearly understood this, as in verse 22, in this very same chapter, it says the following. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? So the disciples clearly understood that it was Jesus that was going to come back to them as the another comforter. In Mark 16 verse 12, it says something really interesting. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. This verse shows us clearly how Christ can come to us in another form and yet be himself. So this text, which Trinitarians use to try and prove the doctrine of the Trinity, has again just been well and truly shattered. We are now going to look at our final misunderstood Bible text and this can be found in John chapter 16 verse 7 to 8. And it reads, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This verse is very similar to the previous scripture verse we dealt with in John 14 verse 16. As we shall all see, Jesus was speaking about himself. Jesus often used third person pronouns in his discourses. Third person language explained simply means the third person point of view belongs to the person being talked about. For example, here are some third person pronouns, him, he, his, himself, it, and these are the very same words Christ used about himself. Let's take a look at some scripture examples of Christ using some of these third person pronouns to refer to himself. In John 4 verse 10 it reads, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So we see here that Christ referred to himself as him and he, using the third person pronouns. Let's take a look at another example of Jesus using third person language. In John 6:27, it reads, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him have God the Father sealed. So again, here we see that Christ referred to himself as him using a third person pronoun. Another example of Jesus using third person language can be found in Matthew chapter 17, verse 22 to 23, and it reads, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again, and they were exceeding sorry. So here we see Jesus again referring to himself as him and he, 
talking in third person pronouns. In the Desire of Ages, in chapter 83, the walk to Emmaus, it has this to say, they did not think that the subject of their conversation was walking by their side, for Christ referred to himself as though he were another person. So we see that the scriptures interprets itself when it comes to seemingly difficult Bible passages. Those people who use John 16 verse 7 to 8 to substantiate the doctrine of the Trinity have now seen their hopes shattered by the plain testimony of God's holy word. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Throughout the Bible, we see evidence of the Trinity. At the creation of the world, God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. As Christians, we are to complete the Great Commission in the name of each member of the Trinity. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God the Eternal Spirit was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation, and redemption. He is as much a person as are the Father and the Son. He inspired the writers of Scripture. He filled Christ's life with power. He draws and convicts human beings, and those who respond He renews and transforms into the image of God. Sent by the Father and the Son to be always with His children, He extends spiritual gifts to the Church empowers it to bear witness to Christ, and in harmony with the scriptures, leads it into all truth. Now we come unto the seemingly difficult spirit of prophecy quotes, which many Seventh-day Adventists use in support of the Trinity doctrine. Do these quotes actually really support this theory? Let's take a look and see. The first misunderstood spirit of prophecy quote which some Seventh-day Adventists like to use in support of the Trinity can be found in Sermons and Talks, Volume 2, 1899. And it reads, We need to realize that the Holy Spirit who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds unseen by human eyes. That the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. So, is this verse really talking about a separate and distinct third being? Who is this unseen person? Let's allow the spirit of prophecy to interpret itself. In the Ministry of Healing, it says this, Christ walks unseen through our streets. With messages of mercy, he comes to our homes. In Testimonies to Ministers, it again tells us who this unseen person is. How few realize that Jesus unseen is walking by their side. How ashamed many would be to hear his voice speaking to them and to know that he heard all their foolish common talk. In Cole Porter Ministry, it has this to say, The Lord Jesus, standing by the side of the canvasser, walking with them, is the chief worker. If we recognize Christ as the one who is with us to prepare the way, the Holy Spirit by our side will make impressions in just the lines needed. And in the Southern Work in 1898, it has this to say on who this unseen person is. That Christ should manifest himself to them and yet be invisible to the world, was a mystery to the disciples. 
They could not understand the words of Christ in their spiritual sense. They were thinking of that outward, visible manifestation. They could not take in the fact that they could have the presence of Christ with them, and yet he be unseen by the world. They did not understand the meaning of a spiritual manifestation. So, allowing the spirit of prophecy to interpret itself explains convincingly this misunderstood quote. Therefore, when Trinitarians like to use this quote to uphold the false doctrine of the Trinity, this has now been well and truly shattered. Let's take a look at another misunderstood spirit of prophecy quote which some Seventh-day Adventists like to use to defend the Trinity. In the Desire of Ages, it has this to say, Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. The question that we need to ask is, who is this third person who can help us to overcome sin? Let's allow the spirit of prophecy to interpret this for us. Reading in that same book, it gives us the answer and it reads, Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. So we see that it is Christ that gives us his spirit to help us to overcome all sin within our lives. In Evangelism, page 275, it has this to say, about Christ and it reads Christ is present by his Holy Spirit it is this spirit that brings conviction to hearts as Christ celebrated this ordinance with his disciples conviction came to the hearts of all save Judas so we shall be convicted as Christ speaks to our hearts so we are told that it is Christ that does the conviction in our hearts through His Holy Spirit. So, allowing the spirit of prophecy to interpret itself explains convincingly this misunderstood quote found in A Desire of Ages. Therefore, when Trinitarians like to use this quote to uphold the false doctrine of the Trinity, this has now been well and truly shattered. Let's take a look at another misunderstood spirit of prophecy quote. This is a classic quote used by some Adventists to substantiate the theory of the Trinity and is taken from that popular book called Evangelism. Let's take a look and read through it now. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. The question that needs to be asked is, who are the three living persons in heaven? Let's allow the spirit of prophecy to interpret this question for us. In the Signs of the Times, dated June the 19th, 1901, with numerical brackets supplied for emphasis, this quote says this, our sanctification is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
It is the fulfillment of the covenant that God has made with those who bind themselves up with him to stand with one, him, which is the father, with two, his son, and with three, his spirit, in holy fellowship. Have you been born again? Have you become a new being in Christ Jesus? Then cooperate with the three great powers of heaven who are working in your behalf. So we see that Ellen White emphasized that the three great powers of heaven are one, the Father, two, his Son, Jesus Christ, and three, his Spirit. Let's emphasize this point further by looking at another quote found in the Review and Herald, October 26, 1897, and it reads, Christ gave his followers a positive promise that after his ascension, he would send them his spirit. Go ye therefore, he said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, a personal God, and of the Son, a personal Prince and Saviour, and of the Holy Ghost, sent from heaven to represent Christ, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So, Ellen G. White in original writings actually supplied the brackets in this quote. So, she clearly identified that there are only two personal beings, the Father and His Son. In Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 14, dated 1899, again, Ellen White makes it clear who the Holy Spirit is. And it reads, Lift up Christ in His power, in the person of the Holy Spirit. He is waiting for them to open the door and admit Him. His presence will thrill every nerve and muscle. So we see that Ellen G. White never identified the Holy Spirit as being a separate and distinct being called God the Holy Spirit. In fact, she always linked the Spirit to either the Father or His Son. And this fact is proven in the following quote. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, it reads, They have one God and one Saviour and one Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is to bring unity into their ranks. So, allowing the Spirit of Prophecy to interpret itself explains convincingly this misunderstood quote. Therefore, when Trinitarians like to use this quote to uphold the false doctrine of the Trinity, this has now been well and truly shattered. Our final misunderstood spirit of prophecy quote can be found again in that popular book entitled Evangelism. And it reads, The Holy Spirit has a personality else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person, else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. The question that needs to be asked concerning this quote is, who is this divine person called the Holy Spirit? Let's now allow the spirit of prophecy to interpret this question for us. In Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 14, dated 1899, it reads, Lift up Christ in His power, in the person of the Holy Spirit. He is waiting for them to open the door and admit Him. His presence will thrill every nerve and muscle. Every organ will begin to perform its functions 
and the whole man will be restored to spiritual soundness as he sees Christ by faith. Again, who is that divine person who is the Holy Spirit? In Letters 124, dated 1897, it reads, When trials overshadow the soul, remember the words of Christ. Remember that he is an unseen presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. Then, in Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, it has this to say. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is Himself, divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent Himself as present in all places by His Holy Spirit as the Omnipresence. So, allowing the spirit of prophecy to interpret itself explains convincingly this misunderstood quote. We have just seen that the Holy Spirit as a divine being is Christ himself. Therefore, when Trinitarians like to use this quote to uphold the false doctrine of the Trinity, this has now been well and truly that. So, how is it that Christ can manifest himself to us? Something many Christians do not understand is that Christ has two natures and this is what we're going to look into right now. In Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 14, dated 1899, it has this to say about Christ's two natures. And it reads, Christ had two natures, the nature of a man and the nature of God. In him, divinity and humanity were combined. Upon his mediatorial work hangs the hope of the perishing world. No one but Christ has ever succeeded in living a perfect life, in living a pure, spotless character. He exhibited a perfect humanity combined with deity, and by preserving each nature distinct, he has given to the world a representation of the character of God and the character of a perfect man. He shows us what God is and what man may become, godlike in character. In Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, it has this to say about Christ's two natures. His finite nature was pure and spotless, divine nature that led him to say to Philip, He that have seen me have seen the Father also was not humanized. Neither was humanity deified by the blending or union of the two natures. Each retained its essential character and properties. In Signs of the Times, dated May 10th, 1899, Ellen G. White had this to say about Christ's two natures. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity. Yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine, nor the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. 
the two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ, closely and inseparably one, and yet they had distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. Then, in Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, Ellen G. White has this to say about Christ's nature. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. Then, in a desire of ages, Ellen G. White was inspired to write this. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his Spirit the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. While he delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence is still with his church. And again, in the desire of ages, it reads, Looking upon him in his humiliation as he walked a man among men, they had not understood the mystery of his incarnation, the dual character of his nature. So, we see that Christ had two natures, a human one and a divine one. So what form did the Son of God have before coming to this earth? Let's take a look in the Holy Scriptures. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 6, it says this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So here, the scripture states something very interesting, that Jesus had the same nature as his Father. And what form? does God have? Let's take a look in the scriptures to get the answer to this. Let's take a look at John 4 verse 24 and it says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what form does a spirit have? Let's take a look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, but it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit have not flesh and bones as you see me have. So we see then that God's nature is not composed of flesh and bones, because in the previous scripture verse, in John 4.24, it says that God is a spirit. But he does have a form like us, as in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, we are told that we are made in his image. Therefore then, Christ had the same nature as his Father, a spirit form, a divine nature. This is confirmed in John chapter 17 verse 5 where it says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
the Father and Son made a tremendous sacrifice to redeem us. We know that Jesus gave up something very special to him to come and rescue us. He was the King of the universe and yet he became humble as a man. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 8 it says this, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In the Old and New Testament eras, the believers were always told to be aware of deception. They were told to test every new doctrine which people would bring to them by the unerring guide, the law and testimony found in Isaiah 8.20. And it reads, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In the great controversy, we as God's professed people are cautioned to do the same thing, and it reads, To the law and to the testimony, while conflicting doctrines and theories abound, the law of God is the one unerring rule by which all opinions, doctrines and theories are to be tested, says the prophet. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So clearly then, we are told that we are to test every opinion, doctrine or theory by the law and to the testimony. Let's see if the Trinity Doctrine passes this test. In the commandments of God, the very first commandment says this, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 verse 3 How then is the Trinity Doctrine violating the very first commandment? Let's take a look again at the first commandment of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Who is the me referring to in this commandment? Is it referring to the three co-eternal beings as many Christians believe? Or is it referring to a singular supreme being. Let's take a look at the scriptures to get the answer to these questions. In Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 24 it reads, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, 
But I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6, it reads, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 8, it reads, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So, we see that so far from the scriptures, whoever the me is, this supreme being is declaring that there is no other God beside him. Let's take a look at some more scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 5, it reads, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Then, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21 to 22, it reads, Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who have declared this from ancient time? Who have told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Saviour. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. In Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9, it has this to say, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. And finally, in Hosea chapter 13 and verse 4, it reads, Yet I am the Lord by God, from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Saviour beside me. Let's now look at Mark chapter 12 and verses 28 to 32 to get more info on who this God is, who states that there is no other gods beside him. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 32, it reads, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And the scribes said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. So, in Mark 12, it declares that there is only one God and that there is none other but He. Now we turn to John chapter 17 verses 1 to 3 to get the identity of who this one God is and it reads, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life 
to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Did you catch that? The only true God is the Father. So going back to the first commandment, we can now see who is the me referring to in this commandment. And it is of course, God the Father. The importance of knowing this knowledge is emphasized in Mark 12 verse 34 where after the scribe has asked Jesus about the first commandment and the rest of the commandments, Jesus commends the scribe by saying the following, And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any questions. So for people, to belittle the doctrine of knowing who God is, is really a big offence to God and his Son, especially in light of John chapter 17 verse 3, where it reads, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We have just learnt from the scriptures that there is only one true God. In light of this knowledge, how is the Trinity violating the first commandment? Well, the Trinity doctrine states that there are three gods. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Three co-eternal beings who are all called God, who are one in government and one in purpose. But this goes directly against the commandment of God, where it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God the Father is the me being spoken of here, and not other gods. In fact, in the scriptures, we can find the title, God the Father. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, where it reads, But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. But nowhere can we find the title, God the Son? In fact, in the scriptures, we can find many scripture verses that refer to Christ as the Son of God. But Christ can also be called God due to his unique status of being begotten from God his Father sometime in eternity. But he is still the Son of God. And finally, nowhere in the scriptures do we find the title, God the Holy Spirit. It is called the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ, but never do we find the expression, God the Holy Spirit, in scripture, which then confirms that there is no third separate distinct being called God the Holy Spirit. In 1888 materials, it reads, There is no place for gods in heaven above. God is the only true God. He fills all heaven. Those who now submit to his will shall see his face, and his name will be in their foreheads of all who are pure and holy. As Christians, we sometimes fail to see how serious sin is in the eyes of a holy God. When asking many Christians what is the purpose of the law, 
many will reply with the answer to point out sin. This is correct, but it also goes much deeper than that. In Romans chapter 7 verse 12 to 13, it gives us the main reason for the law. And it reads, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, work in death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So there we have it folks. The whole purpose of the law is to make sin exceedingly sinful to us. You see, we have been born in sin and shaped in iniquity and at times we don't really see how sin is offensive to God at times. The law serves to remind us that there are things which are very offensive to God and His Son. One of them is this Trinity doctrine which clearly breaks the first commandment. Whether you like it or not, anyone still subscribing to the views of the Trinity after receiving clear testimonies from the scripture stating otherwise is breaking the commandment of God and is in open sin and is dishonouring God by putting other gods before him. And we know that anyone who is sinning willfully, there remaineth a certain, fearful, looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. It's time to break this strange idol from our lives. When our church was founded, what did our pioneers believe? The fundamental principles or beliefs established in 1872 that Ellen G. White and the pioneers believed are somewhat different than what the SDA church believes today. First of all, the foundational beliefs about the Godhead that the early pioneers held is that there is one God, a personal spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient and eternal, infinite in wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth and mercy, unchangeable and everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. And secondly, that there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom he created all things and by whom they do consist. And their fundamental beliefs about the Holy Spirit is widely different from what the current SDA Church believes today. In the Fundamental Principles number 16, the pioneers all believed that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and is not a separate and distinct individual as many SDAs believe today. In fact, the changes in what the pioneers and the current church beliefs are regarding the personality of God is so stark that SDA historian George Knight wrote this startling admission in Ministry magazine. This is what he had to say. Most of the founders of Seventh-day Adventism would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. More specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. This change 
in our fundamental principles, did not catch our God by surprise. In fact, through the process of time, God gave Ellen G. White a worrying prophecy concerning the great changes that would take place within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The vision informed us that the pillars of our faith would be given up, our religion would be changed, that the fundamental principles would be accounted as error, and that a new organization would emerge. Let's read this unsettling prophetic vision now. In Selected Messages, Book 1, it reads, The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith, and engage in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church will be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which, without God, is worthless. Their foundation would be built on sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Sadly, this is exactly what has happened to our beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the only part of this prophecy which has yet to be fulfilled is where it states that storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. This has yet to come. Well, you know, again, there are times, you know, there are two points on the pioneers. Number one, they were growing in understanding. Our pioneers used to be, believe in a 25-20, and they got to a point they didn't advocate it anymore. Our pioneers used to believe, uh, you know, that the Sabbath started at 6 o'clock, and then they got to an understanding that was broader. Our pioneers used to go ahead and say, oh, the Godhead thing is not true, and then later on they progressed. It was progressive for our brethren. We should not build our doctrines strictly off of what the pioneers believed. The pioneers were very much subject to error. The pioneers were very much subject to error. The pioneers were very much subject to error. Some in the Seventh-day Adventist Church have claimed that Ellen G. White changed her beliefs regarding God to believe in the Trinity. Is this assumption correct? But before finding this out, the Scriptures establishes a foundation regarding prophets. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verses 1 to 5. And it reads, If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, 
which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. These scriptures are clear in that the Lord is telling us that if any prophet tells us to go and serve other gods, that we are not allowed to listen to that prophet again. So, if Ellen G. White tells us to go after the Trinity Doctrine, then she is indeed a false prophet, and I have every right to burn her books. Let's see if she indeed changed her religion. In Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 21, dated 1906, she has this to say, I should be an unfaithful watchman were I to hold my peace when I see the very foundations of our faith being torn away by those who have departed from the faith and who are now adrift without an anchor. In this time, when false doctrines are being taught, we are to teach the same truth that we have taught for the past half century. I have not changed my faith one jot or one tittle. Then in Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, dated 1906, she has this to say, The truths given us after the passing of the time in 1844 are just as certain and unchangeable as when the Lord gave them to us in answer to our urgent prayers. The visions that the Lord has given me are so remarkable that we know that what we have accepted is the truth. This was demonstrated by the Holy Spirit. Light, precious light from God establish the main points of our faith as we hold them today. And what were the main points of the faith Ellen G. White and the pioneers held back then concerning the personality of God? It is these very same fundamental principles. Today, in the church, there is a war going on between truth and error. However, we know that truth will win. We are making a plea to the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to destroy your Trinity idol and return back to the worship of the one true God that was once delivered to the saints. Already the clouds of God's retributive judgments are gathering over you. Repent, Seventh-day Adventists, before the storm and tempest of God's retributive judgments sweep away the structure. <laughs>